shop, we can't lose, you can't win, if you snooze, so do more, and say less, so get up, and let's work, and be the best, yeah, you tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast, yeah, the Steve Gunner Podcast, you tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast, get up, it's the Steve Gunner Podcast. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Steve Gunter podcast, where we discuss the steps, the strategies, and the mindset of real estate investing tailor-made for the pro athlete. I'm your host, Steve Gunter, and it's an honor and privilege to be with you today. Look, folks, today I have an incredible guest on with us. Um... First of all, I've gotten an opportunity to get to know this brother uh, over the past uh, few weeks. And man, I'm telling you, we, we, we have a gem with us today. Julian Williams is a member of the Compass Sports and Entertainment Division out of Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. His client base includes, and check out these acronyms, folks, pro athletes from the MLB, NFL, NBA, track and field, boxing, as well as C-suite executives. Julian is a former professional baseball player himself who transitioned into real estate and today is recognized as one of the top real estate agents in the country. He's a proud husband and father of two. And every now and then, he likes to hop on a golf course and swing that club around. Mr. Williams, what an honor to have you on the pod today, sir. Hey, man, thanks for having me on, Steve. Appreciate the introduction, the kind words. So, Well, look, man, you deserve every single last one of them. And, you know, I want to start off, Julian, with, look, just, just asking you this question, man. So I'm a season ticket holder with the Carolina Panthers. And, um, and the question I've been getting the most has been, from folks just asking, hey, can they join me on uh, for the Panthers and Cowboys game in December? And I'm like, dude, you're not even from Texas and you're a Cowboys fan. Why do y'all have so many fans around the country? What's going on with that, man? I mean, hey, first and foremost, it's America's team, right? <laughs> That's what they say. Hey, hey we got to we got to get that out right off the bat, right? <laughs> Jerry Jones sold that one, didn't he? He did a good job. Seriously, man. No, it's it's interesting, man. We have a lot of it's a lot of Cowboys fans. You're right, all over the country. So it's uh, you know, it's one of those things, man. You get that excitement every year, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, is there an opportunity? Is there a chance? Um, yeah. But man, they've always known for bringing in uh, a lot of attention here. They're good at the marketing side of things, PR, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, the Cowboys do a really good job, man, on really just continuing to to make that that um, that brand stand out. And so it's, if, even if you're not a football fan, you know, you, you you'll catch a Cowboy game every now and then. So, yep. Yep. And if I recall, you don't live too far away from the stadium, right? No, I'm spoiled, man. I'm close. I'm right here. I'm literally an Uber drive away. You don't even have to get Ooh. on a highway or interstate. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's nice to be this close. So. My goodness. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the traffic. You just go. It's interesting, right? Because, you know, where we are positioned out in the area here, it's um, it's not heavy traffic. You know, you got your traffic uh-huh. going out of interstate. So we got a cross street that kind of is like a like, a, you know, it's one of those if you know, you know, type of ways to get mm-hmm. there. So uh, it's it's pretty sweet, man. It's like a little direct access. So we've been very fortunate here the last eight and a half years living where we live. So, yeah, I love that. Man, so awesome. I, I'm jealous because I got to travel to go to the game and I got a couple of hours I got to, you know, you know, take to get down there. But mm-hmm. look, so you come from the world of sport and you've been around it your entire life, Julian. Mm-hmm. Um, prior to real estate, you were a professional baseball player and as an athlete, making that transition away from sport into the business world, what was that process like for you? And the reason I asked that question is because, you know, having been an athlete myself, but I I didn't have a a, a professional career, uh, but I know some, many guys who have, and 
and, and that transition sometimes can be a, a rocky one. Uh, what was it like for you? For sure. Man, that's a great question. So you're right. Yeah. So all I knew growing up, I was a baseball player since I was five. Right. And so um, I was blessed, man, and fortunate that my parents were both entrepreneurs, uh, specifically my mother was in real estate. So she was a real estate broker. Mm. And so I, I was actually always around it, um, kind of in the teenage years, you know, kind of really understanding what mom was doing um, on the real estate side of things. Um, but honestly, I never really thought about going down that path. You know, I knew it was an opportunity there for me. Um, but again, you know, I was straight focused on baseball, right? That's the first mm -hmm. priority. Um, going through high school, uh, being a dual sport athlete in baseball and football and suffered a, a head concussion injury in my junior year of football. And my dad and parents were like, hey, listen, man, we're done with football. Focus yeah. on baseball your senior year. And um, I had the opportunity to travel to Florida and um, it's, it's still around, but it was the baseball factory where I had an opportunity to showcase, um, you know, around a national level. And and I was tabbed uh, on All-American with the baseball factory. And so I came into my senior year and um, had a good year. Um, you know, and baseball is different, though, because once you sign Division One at a high school, you have to wait till your junior year before you can declare yourself for the MLB draft. Hmm, I didn't know so, that. Mm -hmm. So in Texas, man, we have a really phenomenal uh, junior college route. Uh, a lot of a lot of smaller junior colleges that get a lot of attention out here. And it's kind of been a great segue for a lot of guys to, you know, to kind of enter into that collegiate level. Um, have an opportunity to really showcase themselves and be eligible for the draft after their freshman year. So a lot of scouts are now recruiting quite heavily out here in Texas in the junior college route ranking. So um, I did that. Yeah, two years um, in junior college, put up some accolades, All-American both years. Uh, but unfortunately, man, I didn't get drafted. So we were like, what's going on? You know, I'm doing everything mm -hmm. the right way. I'm playing ball. I'm, you know, 3.6, you know, almost 4.0 GPA. Uh, conference player of the year. And so um, at that point, I kind of realized that it's not just about how good you are. I think there's a lot of things that go into it, right? Um, just mm -hmm. opportunity, right place, right time, um, et cetera, right? And so I think that was the first taste of it. They're like, man, you know, um, I went on and played collegiate division one baseball. I had an opportunity to play at Kansas State on the scholarship. And so, uh, but my route was a little bit different. You know, there's a um, minor league baseball, but there's also the independent professional league. It's kind of like your own independently owned and operated um, level to where you can come in and play at that level. It's usually about a double A equivalent. Mm -hmm. For those that know baseball, it's like about a double A. Um, and then the organizations can literally come in and purchase your contract and you could be suited up in somebody's affiliate double or triple A team literally the next day. And mm -hmm. so um, it's a pretty cool way to go about it, um, but it's a grind. It's definitely a grind. So, um, I did that for three years, but during that time, um, I did take my parents up on it. I went and got my real estate license. Um, and I actually was selling houses in the off season. Cause for those that know baseball and the minors, man, you don't really, you know, you don't make, you don't draw a paycheck like that. Right. So you're yeah. talking, you know, less than 1200 bucks a month and some food per diem on bus rides on trips. So, yeah. uh, you got to have a way in the off season to survive. And so, um, that was my first taste of really, you know, cutting my teeth in real estate. Um, and at the time, it really was just more about the financial situation, right? I need to make a little money um, so I can continue to train, travel, and put myself in the best situation to uh, get to the next level. Um, but yeah, so we did that 2006, 2007, 2008. Um, and then I came out in 2008 after battling some injuries. Um, I kept tearing up my hamstring. You know, I was a, I was an outfielder. I transitioned into pitching my last part of 2007, which was a pretty unique experience with that transition. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a lefty. So um, are you really? I'm a lefty. I am. So uh, and, you know, of course, in the National League, you know, pitchers hit. And so uh, and when I was playing, that was a big deal. So um, I had some juice left in the in the, in the arms. So um, first year I transitioned to pitch and I was top 10 in the league in ERA. Actually, later we went to the championship round and. I had a shot to go the spring train and throw for the Tigers in Lakeland, Florida. So uh, it was a pretty surreal experience, right? Um, but then I came back, they sent me back and said I wasn't quite ready. So mm. I played another year in 2008 in the independent rankings. And uh, and I think that that league where I was pitching, they kind of figured me out that second year. So things didn't go as planned. So that's mm -hmm. the thing, man, when you're at that level, you have to know how to make adjustments and uh, that experience is everything, you know? So yeah. yeah, you can have that first year where everything's clicking, but then, you know, as you start getting into that second and third year, 
you know, you, it was really tough to kind of get over that hurdle to really transition into, you know, the mindset and the uh, uh, just what goes into preparing yourself as a professional uh, pitcher. And so um, I was playing with guys that had, you know, previous professional experience. They were, you know, double A, triple A, ex major leaguers that maybe were going through rehab and they got released and they were kind of getting their way, you know, back to the show through the independent rankings. So I was mm -hmm. sharing a bullpen with those guys. And you got to remember, I wasn't a pitcher naturally. So just kind of watching how those guys went about their business um, and seeing how they prepared their body, their mindset, et cetera. It was interesting, right? So, um, but yeah, I bounced around that year several different times. You know, I was in four different organizations and um, I was dating my now wife at the time and I was just getting mentally beat up about it. And so I made the transition to exit out after that season um, in 2008. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, I think it's time to transition out. Um, I want to get married and, and take that next chapter into my professional career, which was real estate. So that was the segue. Yeah. Um, but I had been kind of grooming myself the last few years with, you know, learning the business. I had always been around the business. So it was a, it was a relatively easy transition for me. Yeah. Um, I just had to shift that mindset. Right. And I think for me, it was more about not just doing it to do it, but I wanted to do something that I really cared about and I was passionate about. And I think that was where I had to realize that real estate wasn't just about the money. Uh, we were actually really making a positive impact in families' lives. And and that's when it kind of really set on me that, man, it's bigger than me. And finally, at that point, I kind of realized that this is definitely what I want to do. And I want to put that energy and effort into being the best um, real estate person I could be. So it was a, it was interesting. What did you learn during your time in sport and all of the, the failures, the successes, the lessons that you were able to glean from that period of time? What did you learn or take away from that and begin to use towards uh, towards business. And there's so many takeaways being an athlete, for sure. Um, I think right off the bat, it's just uh, dealing with failure. I think um, mm. in, in, in baseball specifically, you know, as a hitter, I was an outfielder initially, right, my whole life. Um, you got to realize that you can fail seven times out of 10 as a hitter and you're still a 300 batting average, you know, um, you'll be a hall of famer if you can hold those numbers throughout your professional career. Wow. Uh, which means you're failing seven times out of 10, every, every 10 at bats. Um, now remember you only get about four at bats a game, right? So you go, you go in a game and you've got 20,000 fans and they're booing you cause you struck out, you know, the first at bat, then you get up to bat again, you strike out again, then you get up your third time, mm -hmm. you ground out, then you get up your fourth time, you strike out. And that's all you're going to be able to see that game. You got to go home and hit the showers and think about that, right? And mm -hmm. on top of that, fans are booing you. You got to get back out the next day and do it again. So um, it's interesting, you know, some of those takeaways for me, for sure, it was just dealing with adversity as well. Um, you know, going through the injuries and whatnot, you know, you, you got to bounce back. And so playing through that, uh, just understanding how to be a professional. I would say that's the third thing for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I think just being a professional and go about your business, uh, the preparation that goes into it in the off season, the things that you do when nobody else sees what you're doing. I think um, it's just that extra work. Um, and then of course that competitive spirit, man, we all want to win. I mm -hmm. think being an athlete, you're so competitive. You don't just wake up to do this just to do it. You want to go be great at it. Uh, you want to do it as best as you can. And I think that, you know, from a negotiation standpoint with our clients, you know, that's important, right? We want to make sure that we win that. We want to win that every time. So uh, those are some of the key things for sure that help transition into business for sure. Not too long ago, you and I were out at dinner with a number of colleagues um, uh, from our division. Uh, and, and we did the uh, go around the table and tell me a little bit about yourself uh, sort of thing. And one of the highlights about you that that really stood out to me, uh, Julian, was your ability to observe the facts, observe many different facts, and then articulate those about your market in such a way that literally bought people in and asking to hear more. You understand what I'm saying? And, and the reason I mention that is because you know, that's a rare skill. That's a rare ability. But you have the ability to do that uh, because oftentimes when, you know, people are discussing facts, it leads folks to falling asleep. 
you know. But but for you though, it was it was as though we were listening to a story. You know, you were able to take those facts and place it in a story form and then articulate uh your market about the Dallas Fort Worth area and and, and really give us some uh, some some gems to uh, to, uh, to to leave away with. It, what how did you hone that skill who taught you that where did that come from <laughs> you know it's funny you know people are going to laugh at this but if you've been in the business as long as i have i mean i got licensed at 20 at 22 yeah you know i just turned 41 man so almost 20 years in this business and back when i got licensed initially man we had the old school maps go book that uh you know my mother used to always break out so when i was a 12 year old kid she would Hey, Julian, get my maps go book. We got to go travel to here. And I would ride with her <laughs> all over the Metroplex. And so, man, there were streets that weren't streets back then. They were, you know, it was just destination and coordinates, right? From point A to point B. How did we get there? You know, there was no interstates and intersections and all these toll roads that we have now. So I think for me, I just had to really learn that, um, you know, and then as our market started growing over the last couple of decades, you know, now we've got, you know, access points and toll roads and interstate that four lane highways that get you from Tarrant County to Denton County within less than an hour. You know, it's interesting. And and you're covering about four, four different cities on the way, you know, so um, <laughs> it's interesting. So like me living where I live now, I'm pretty much on top of the Dallas Fort Worth Airport. So mm -hmm. it's, I, I call that kind of the pinpoint. Right. And then everything else goes north, east, south, and west from there. And so, um, and you can get from where I live, literally 20 minutes north, east, south, and west to get you as far as, you know, Fort Worth proper to east of downtown Fort, uh, area. And then you can go north and you look up and you're in Frisco in about 25 minutes. So um, it's interesting. So I think that's one thing, just kind of being around that with my mother and riding with her back in the day. Um, and then also, man, it's... Um, you know, it's our it's our duty as real estate professionals to really have a working knowledge of our mm -hmm. markets, right? Um, because everybody's situation is different. You know, we get people relocated here from all over the country, and everyone has a different appetite for what they want in a mm -hmm. in a home, in an area. You know, whether they're empty nesters or they've got small kids or they've got kids that are high school level um, or they want to get in and out of the airport. Um, you know, something you got to find out what's important to them. And as you start digging deeper and asking the right questions, um, mm. you got to be you got to be prepared to, dart, you know, help navigate them on those opportunities and options are available for them. And so, um, you know, back as an independent broker, which we didn't really talk too deep about that, but I was an owner operator for several years. And so, um, you know, at that point, you know, you just felt as a broker, you know, I had to, I didn't have offices in multiple locations. Yeah, it was just one office. And I had to know everywhere. So, you know, mm -hmm. hey, Julian, can you help in Frisco? You know, uh, can you help in uh, Midlothian, far south? Can you help me in, in, in Weatherford or, you know, Palo Pinto County? You know, of course, the answer is always yes when you're growing your business, right? Yep. So, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, and then you go out there and you be, go become a market expert in a week or so, trying to learn everything you can find out about it, uh, that area. But man, you can also some good resources, uh, the economic development um, in each city. There's a lot of you know, public information that's available that you can tap into with the local mm -hmm. um, municipalities and whatnot on what type of economic development is coming downstream. Uh, what's the city's master plan, you know, over the next five to 10 years? And so, um, and then you can kind of reverse engineer on where it's been, where it's at and see now where it's going. So those are some really good high level talking points you can have with your clients for sure. Uh, just a little bit extra work you got to go through, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but again- but but isn't that, you know, to that point, though, that's also part of being a good fiduciary, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. And, and, you know, the, the client, even if they have lived in a particular area for, for years, rarely fully understands what's going on around them. And, and you being a real estate professional and knowing what's to come, what's currently happening, who's moving in, who's moving out, where the jobs are located, you know, what the local economy is doing, what the school systems are doing. All of this is really vital information when it comes to talking about investing in real estate in the local market. Wouldn't you say that's also the case? 100%. Um, I agree 100%, you know, because it's interesting because like you mentioned school districts. I mean, we have like the city where I live in is the city of Arlington. 
but it's not Arlington Independent School District. It's Hershulis Bedford Independent School District, but the city of Arlington. And so when you look at a greatschools.org or you start diving deeper into the educational system, you know, you'll see that HEB has been, um, you know, generally speaking, it's been higher ranking, you know, the teacher to student ratio is a little different and, you know, there's newer schools because, you know, the, the, the metro is starting to grow a little bit more. So they're having to come in and there's a lot of bond money involved where these schools are getting enhanced. So um, there was a bond that was approved Prop 1 here in our city where they're actually, we're getting a new high school. Uh, that feeds from our kids into that high school. And it's beautiful. They just released the renderings. And of course, that's probably like a five to seven year play down the line. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you got a kid that's six years old and you're starting to forecast, okay, are we going to be here for the next seven to 10 years? Or should we get ahead perhaps in another growing market that we can capitalize on an opportunity um, where we're seeing potential growth that we can then leverage this asset or this investment that we're in now you know, mm -hmm. keep it as an asset or do we sell it at the type of the market and then transition to an early entry market to where we can then take the benefit of that in the next five to seven years and take that appreciation that we're going to see forecasted over the next decade, perhaps. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That that that's so well said. And I think, you know, seeing the long term um, opportunities is is of great importance to customers. But again, Having an agent in your corner, such as yourself, uh, who's able to to give those that insight uh, to the customer, to the client is is of vital importance, I think. Let's talk about uh, your family, man. Uh, you mentioned that you come from a real estate family. Your mother uh, built a business. Talk to me about how much legacy means to you as you're carrying on the family business? I mean, legacy is everything, right? I think it's, um, you know, first and foremost, it's, you know, people say, you know, um, it's a, not really necessarily about what you do, it's what you, how you're remembered once it's all said and done, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just like our service industry that we're in, you know, you can have an opportunity to serve a client, right? Um, and get that opportunity through a referral or just a relationship, but Will you get another referral or will that client come back? And most likely they will based on the level of uh, service that, that they and how they felt, you know, during that transaction. So uh, we've been blessed, man. I think that, you know, it's obviously a service first industry that we are in. And that's the mindset that we have. Uh, watching mom man, mom was a pioneer. She blazed the trail for sure. Um, so growing up where I grew up here in the east part of Fort Worth. You know, uh, my mother, uh, my father being black, African-American, my mother, Hispanic, Mexican uh, descent. Um, she opened the first Spanish speaking real estate office um, in our county, you know, over almost 40 years ago. And so uh, no one was really doing that. No one was really, you know, female, bilingual, you know, mm -hmm. serving that clientele that she, you know, that she wanted to help. Right. It was for her, it was a matter of serving people that were told no. You know, or felt as though that they didn't have the mindset or the knowledge to 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 pursue, you know, obtaining real estate, you know. And so um, um, there was a lot of programs, non-traditional loan programs that um, that she was kind of on the front end of that, you know, some NACA program, which NACA now is prevalent around the country in most right. markets. Um, but then there was the I-10 loan. So the I-10 is a temporary ID number that most Mexican citizens didn't have a social, but they had a meticula or they had an I-10 number. Well, there were a lot of smaller banks that were actually rolling out these portfolio loan programs that they could use that specific um, ID with no tax returns and obtain a mortgage. And so um, she was on the front end of that over 25 plus years ago and, and been able to help hundreds of families, you know, buy. And so um, actually I lost mom about eight years ago. I don't know if we dove too deep into this on our recent uh, lunch or dinner that we had, but um, you know, it was it was interesting because at 2008, kind of backtrack a little bit, when I retired from baseball, the funny story is that I had my real estate license and my dad, I remember sitting down and he was like, well, you're going to go work with your mother, right? And I was like, well, dad, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know if I want to go straight full time real estate. I think um, I hear mom arguing all the time with lenders <laughs> on the mortgage side of the business, yep. you know, telling me, why don't you do your job? What do you mean? You didn't look at this. And what's their DTI? Did you did you see that that installment debt is less than 12 months and you don't have to count that against their DTI, their ratios? I'm like, mom, what are you talking about right now? Mm -hmm. Like, I want to learn that. 
You know, uh, what is LTV, DTI, overlays, you know, matrix? What is a mortgage matrix sheet? Mm. And so she said, well, son, those are those are mortgage terms and it's going to take time. You know, we've been doing this 30 years and and you'll learn that eventually. I said, no, I want to learn that now. I said, (laughs) how about this? Let me go be a mortgage loan officer. Right. And let me learn that side of the business, because I felt realtors, you know, opening doors and marketing and writing contracts, negotiations is really important. But man, what if I knew the mortgage side of things? So I really understood exactly the financial side of things and how the mortgage works and what is a mortgage and what are guidelines and what are loan programs. Um, And so I kind of want to have that 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 um, that knowledge base. And so in 2008, right, the worst time to get into real estate, you Mm -hmm. know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I went into I had a couple of friends that were working at um, the largest servicer in the country at the time it was countrywide. So countrywide home loans, right? Yep. And so in 2009, I went in, they got me an opportunity, interviewed and got in with Countrywide, who was then later required by Bank of America. And we took on a large service and portfolio. And that was back when President Obama was in office. So we had the Making Home Affordable program, the Making Home Affordable Refinance program. Mm-hmm. And so we were basically uh, centralized sales, you know, taking calls all over the country, helping people refinance their existing mortgages. Um, up to like crazy loan to values, like 125% loan to value just to keep mm. their properties. And so, and then we were on special uh, assignments to where we were uh, helping people with their modifications. And then I got into underwriting. So I was actually calculating, you know, um, income from, you know, K1s and Schedule C's, Schedule E's, et cetera. So I started to learn that side on the underwriting side of yeah. the business. Um, and then I started leading people. So as I started going up through that corporate ladder, people started to recognize the talent and the hard work. And so I had an opportunity to take a management position with Bank of America. Now, granted, over these few years, me doing this, I wasn't really selling real estate because I was so focused on the corporate side of things. So right. um, so I learned that side, um, led a team of 30, uh, 35 auditors. So we were auditing FHA modified loans. Um, you know, it was a good opportunity. It was more of a salary position. So mm-hmm. that commission hustle wasn't there. It was more spreadsheets and operational side of things. Um, but then my mom got ill, man. She was sick. And so we couldn't really figure things out with her. And so, um, you know, being a small, close family, um, you know, mom was the rock of the family. So um, I never forget, man, I was in my corporate office, um, you know, and I get the phone call from my sister. My little sister called me and said, Julian, I'm with mom and dad now. And and we got the news back from the doctor and it's not good. You know, we need you home. And of course, I'm like, well, what do you mean? You know, and she's like, well, um, mom got diagnosed with cancer, you know, and I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, this is not real. And I literally just blacked out. And I told her, I said, listen, I'm on my way. So um, I was 30, man, at just the time, about 10 years ago. So I closed my laptop. I walked in my boss's office and I said, hey, man, I'm out. I'm, I, I'm, I got to get home to be with my family. And he's looking at me. And I had a really good relationship with him and uh, Bo White. So shout out to Bo Mm -hmm. if he sees this podcast. But um, he was just kind of in awe. He's like, well, let's take some time. You want to go on leave of absence or, you know, let's just go about this through HR, et cetera. I said, no, man, I'm I'm literally out. I'm done. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so uh, I gave him my laptop and, you know, I said, you know, we can, you know, let me know. We'll figure this out after the fact. I go to my team, I huddle them up. And I told him this was my last day. I'm I'm out. I have to, you know, part ways and um, I've got a you know situation I gotta handle and deal with. And and yeah. I came home, man. I went, I drove home and and mind you, I was married, uh, my wife. Um and and I blacked out, didn't even get a chance to call her and tell her what was up. We had just bought our first house. And uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. and so I literally get home to my parents' house and I never forget we have our family meeting, you know, mom, dad, brother, sister. And we're sitting there. And as soon as I get there, my mom looks at me and like she's this fiery Latina, you know, you mm-hmm. know a thousand miles an hour, mm-hmm. um, you know, and she looks at me like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? What am I doing here? Man, I'm here to be with you. I'm here yep. to help. What can we do? We got to yep. get this thing figured out. Yep. She said, you need to take your ass back to work. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I said, well, man, the work's beginning now, man. I'm here with you. So don't worry about that job. I quit. I walked mm-hmm. out, you know, she's like, what? And so I had a whole lecture about that, you know, about, are you sure? What did Amanda say? I don't know. I got to call Mm -hmm. her next. (laughs) She's like, Mm -hmm. you didn't tell your wife. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was interesting, man, because that was that a real pivotal point for me. Um, Granted, just to let people know that are probably thinking, like, what did his wife say? Um, You know, I did tell her. And obviously we had a deep conversation with my wife. um, 
and we were early married and she's attorney an attorney as well. Mm -hmm. And so we sat down and we talked about it and I told her, I said, at the end of the day, this is a big transition for us. Uh, we were in a, in a decent financial position to carry our, our, our obligations financially. Um, but yeah, I mean, now it's, it's, it's like, Hey, you're a full-time hundred percent commissions, real estate agent. And, um, and that was the decision that we made. And so for me, it was a matter of everything that had led up to that moment, um, from, being an ex pro athlete to mm -hmm. learning the mortgage origination side to being an underwriter to leading a team, you know, to now, hey, mom, I'm here to help. I don't want you worrying about that. I can help take over this and we can transition. I can help, you know, help here, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like a old school way of doing business yeah. mixed with a new school millennial, you know, and, and we kind of came together and, and, um, and mom, you know, she got a chance to go through treatment. Uh, she still worked. She still enjoyed helping families. Uh, but, um, funny story is my little sister ended up marrying at the time, um, they were dating, but a major league baseball player, shout out okay. to my brother-in-law, Austin Jackson, okay. shout out. Um, and that was when they were with the Tigers on that world series run. Wow. Run. Mm -hmm. So mom got a chance to go get out, go travel the country, go catch some baseball at the highest level. Yeah. And, um, while I kind of maintained the family office there. So it was a really neat thing. And so it was neat to see that how God had a plan, a bigger yep. plan, um, and that it wasn't through me, right? The mm -hmm. son, um, it was through my little sister's husband, now my little brother, you know, mm -hmm. and being able to him to go through that and experience that at the highest level um, and her being able to get go through that as well with them and, um, and us experiencing that as a family, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then unfortunately, man, we ended up losing mom. And so we rebranded things with the company. Um, and so transition, and for uh, several years, um, and then Compass came knocking three years ago, and here we are today. You know, and wow, what a story. I mean, you know, it just really shows uh, the matriarch that mom was and, and how much she uh, was an inspiration to you and to the family, it sounds like to me, and, and how you were able to then... Uh, take that business and, and, you know, and, and build it to something that's, you know, what it is today, which is really, really incredible. Um, I want to, I want to transition, uh, to your sport and entertainment business. I, I, obviously you, you work with clients outside of sport and entertainment as well. Uh, but for sport and entertainment clients specifically, uh, how did, you know, was your brother-in-law your first book of business or, or, or how, how did that all evolve? That's actually a good segue. Yeah. You're hundred percent correct. So it's funny. So, um, was that 2000, probably 2008 around that time when mm -hmm. I came out of, uh, you know, baseball, 2009, 2010, I want to say, um, my brother-in-law, you're right. So he purchased his first house. It was a smaller home out in, uh, um, you know, Rockwall area. And him and my sister were just dating at the time. So it was kind of one of those things where like, you know, we'll help him, you know, as a client, et cetera. My, my sister's kind of involved making decisions and, you know, things like that. So we helped purchase that first house that um, mm -hmm. my mother was really heavily involved in. So I can't really take credit on that, mm -hmm. my sister and my mom. Uh, but fast forward though, um, they end up getting married and end up purchasing another house, right? And so this property, the next property they purchased was a, you know, we really looked at that from an investment standpoint um, in a great location, a really affluent area. Um, but back then, you know, affluent, you know, you could get you 10,000 square foot literally for a million two, a million five, mm. you know, under two million. Now you can't get that today in this mm -hmm. area specifically. And mm -hmm. so, um, so my sister actually found the property and my mother actually negotiated the deal and I actually helped with the financing, mm -hmm. uh, connect them with the lender. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool because that was the first family, everyone kind of realizing their superpower. My mom with her yep. negotiation experience, my sister would be able to sniff out that property. Yep. And then at the time though, my brother-in-law was in a um, early stage of his career. So he wasn't in a contract, a long-term contract. And so he actually had one year left on his contract. And so um, he banked, you know, with a larger bank, you know, which we see that traditionally with some of the younger guys, they're mm -hmm. just used to having that same bank yep. set up when they were in high school and, and whatnot. And so we looked at it and of course that lender was like, nope, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's no continuance of income. And I said, you know, I, I saw that coming a mile away because, you know, 
I knew the bank very right. well, yep. if you know what I mean. Sure. And so um, I said, you know what? That's interesting. I said, well, there's some smaller banks that do portfolio loans. And this is important is understanding what a portfolio loan is. A portfolio loan is basically a loan that a bank can basically set their own guidelines and parameters and their own overlays. And they can make that decision by executive committee, usually mm -hmm. done by the board. And so, um, you know, there's a, you know, and they look at various compensated factors as well. So not just the actual income or continuance, they'll look at the credit, but the credit may not be a big deal in some instances if you have reserves mm. or assets or liquidity. And so we had liquidity to buy the property cash, but we didn't want to exhaust all that cash being so young in his career. If he gets injured, et cetera, now you're burning through cash. Yeah. And so um, we end up doing a portfolio loan and come to find out the um, CEO of the bank was actually a huge fan of the organization my brother-in-law was in. How actually, about that? Detroit, Detroit Tigers. Um, <laughs> from De The gentleman was from Detroit. And so the loan officer branch manager I was working with, Keller Crowley, so shout out to Keller. Um, he's like, man, listen, my boss is in town, the main man. He happens to be here. Come to find out, he's a huge Detroit Tiger fan. Yeah, yeah. And everyone knows, you know, your brother-in-law, man, in Detroit. They're like, of course, he said, sign it. Let's mm -hmm. go. Um, so that was the first interacting on seeing how relationships were important, um, leveraging some of those skill sets from a mortgage standpoint my background and um and that opportunity man they still have that house today um uh, we actually have a texas ranger player in it right now um renting it mm. during the season so um it turned out to be a phenomenal investment and um but yes that was the first um athlete but it's funny because even though that took place several years ago um i still wasn't like let me just segue into this marketplace sure. i was still helping young professionals, my friends, uh, you know, just referral stuff. That was my main book of business, you know, literally 99.9%. Sure. And so I think it took me a little bit later, obviously, to where I felt as though there was a real value that I offer, you know, a lot of the athlete clients that I work with and Absolutely. higher level executives. And that's the mindset thing, man. You know, you got to think, um, I wasn't a major league baseball player. I was an independent journeyman guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I had never really sold a home over a million dollars. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of those negative things like the the devil on one side and then God on the other side. You're kind of yep. hearing, are you good enough? Are you this? Are you that? Yep. And you start thinking, you know, are they going to listen to you when you get on the phone with the financial advisor or wealth manager? And I start thinking, I would hear my parents tell me like, son, you don't even understand, man, like how good you really are, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you've done everything. You've got all this experience. You grew up in the business, so you know it like the back of your hand. And 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 then you know, there's a lot of things there that you got to understand in yourself. And so, uh, fast forward, my brother-in-law, shout out AJ, he had his 30th birthday party at a Top Golf event here, mm. and um, you know, it was a big one, right? 30th. He had everybody was there. Who's who of everybody, right? Yep. We're talking about a lot of. Uh, uh, a profile individuals were there and we're hanging out, having a good time. Sure. And, um, and one of the gentlemen had, had kind of mentioned to, um, a mutual friend that he was wanting to relocate his mother here. And my wife obviously sitting next to me, she kind of hits me a little bit with her elbow. Like, did you hear him? Like he wants to, you know, re relocate his mother. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I'll say his name, I don't have an NDA. So it was mm -hmm. Matt Kemp, Matt mm -hmm. Kemp. Um, at the time. And so um, we had an opportunity and we start talking and he's like, yeah, I want to move my mother out here to Dallas area. And he had, um, you know, everyone knows Matt from the, the Dodgers, you know, mm -hmm. the history he had there and um, had a phenomenal career. And so, um, so he had some time. So we started looking and, you know, he gave me a little price point. We were searching a specific area. And um, it's funny because it turned into where there was one property I sent and I kind of pushed a little bit higher in the envelope because you don't know, people don't know what they can That's actually right. buy and what's available. So That's right. I'm usually about showing if they say I got an $800,000 price point, I'll say, okay, well, here's a 550, 650, here's a 750, 850, right. you know, and here's a 950, 1.2. They got to understand the, the categories. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and so I, I, that's the old school thing I learned, low, mid and high. And then, um, you know, of course, location, we dive into the areas, but I sent that and he saw one at the high is like mm -hmm. 1.2 mm -hmm. and it was about 80% complete. And he says, Julian, I want to see that property. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, so let's go look at the property. We drive through, walk in and he's like, dude, this is, this is it. I like, I like this. Matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I want to buy this and I'm going to move my mom into my house that I have down the street. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it turned into that deal um, opportunity to where I walked him through that. Um, it was interesting because that was my first experience working with a wealth manager. And so he had his wealth manager involved. And so he was actually about to start the season. So it was going to be intricate first transaction working with that type of clientele. Sure. And so um, he was in Atlanta, you know, you know, at the time he was traded to the Braves. And so um, we basically went through this process working with, directly with his wealth manager. He had an assistant here on the ground um, that we worked through this and, and, and we got the deal done. It was it was it was a great opportunity. Um, and then we actually it's funny because he wanted to, it was a new construction. He wanted to remodel the whole house once he closed. So he asked me for some resources mm. on the renovation. So it's a pretty he healthy renovation. And so I said, yeah, I've got a good friend in L.A., um, <clears throat> she does phenomenal work. I can introduce you to her, a couple other people. He says, yeah, let me have her contact. So reached out to her, connected them. Um, and it's funny because before he let her tackle that project, he says, well, I have a small condo where I'm at in Atlanta. So she flew out there. I didn't even know this till after mm -hmm. the fact. She told me, she's like, before I did that one, you know, he flew me to Atlanta, the small condo to fill me out, to test, you know, see my work. And then he let her tackle the main house, uh, which wow. was interesting because... He gave her a strict, strict timeline, and uh, I think he um, she flew um, a flew of her trade guys out as well. I think her electrician and mechanical guy came out, or no, her trim guy. I think her trim guy um, and flew out, put them up, and um, and they went through a pretty massive renovation. It turned out great, you know. Um, but yeah, that was that was kind of that segue, and then after that, you know, things started to kind of evolve um, in different you know parts of the the space for me and myself. But that's what's so interesting, too, about that group of clientele is how important it is to have relationships and to be a relational person, a person who doesn't mind cultivating genuine relationships with people. And, and then also how much they're going to rely on your network of relationships that you already have, you know. Talk a little bit about why that's so important, because to me, that is sort of kind of the fundamentals of the broker business. Being an agent is 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 about really developing a Rolodex of good uh, relationships across many different uh, groups. Yeah, it's important. It's definitely important. And I'll tell you what is lessons learned with that as well, because, you know, as you start to progress in your career, you're going to have a lot of people coming at you telling you what they can do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think going through and sourcing the vets, you know, vetted businesses and, and potential partners that you're, you know, because once you refer someone, I mean, that's definitely a reflection upon you. Right. Yep. Um, is that, you know, if something goes wrong or goes south, then they're going to come back, man, you told me and you did it, you know, so it's, you got to be careful with that. I think over time, though, we have been very fortunate to develop those um, relationships with and, and cultivate those relationships with several different vendors and partners, um, you know, from, you know, loan officers to, um, you know, moving companies to utility service provider, concierge companies, mm -hmm. um, you know, and everything in between insurance agents. Um, handyman yep. <laughs> contractors. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely important for sure. And it's a huge value add to have that, those uh, people you can reach out that are vetted and that can execute on a job for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Julian, let's transition to real estate, man, and talk about your market specifically. Uh, where are the hot neighborhoods around the Dallas Fort Worth uh, market right now that you're encouraging your buyers to really take a look at? <laughs> all over <laughs> man all over man mm -hmm. it's on it's it's hot out here it's it's we're still like most markets are in a really low inventory you know environment um i think we're starting to see um the art the city where i live in believe it or not i mean it's the entertainment hub of the metroplex i mean okay. we've got um city of arlington um it, i live in it's a master plan community and there's thirty three thousand homes it's large you know but uh, we're kind of on the back end of this development project with these developers, but um, close proximity to the airport, some of the HEB, Colleyville, South Lake areas are really blowing up. Um, mm. They've been on the top of people's radar for some time. And, you know, it's um, it's just a really low inventory environment. Everybody wants the same thing. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, between that, you know, under two million dollar price point, if it's if it's totally remodeled, it's cute. You know, in those areas, it's going to sell with multiples quick. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fascinating thing about our marketplace, and you mentioned referrals and relationships, 
Um, we have about 1,200 agents here in our Dallas-Fort Worth market here with Compass. Uh, we've got, I think now we're at six, maybe seven offices. We just opened a new office. Uh, Compass opened a new office here in Frisco. Um, there's the Flower Mound, Lakewood, Park Cities, Fort Worth, and South Lake as well. And so out of those, um, we trade about 40 percent. I think the last statistic was about 40 percent of real estate off market. Hmm. Private hmm. exclusives. Yeah. Yeah. That's heavy. That is that's heavy. A lot. It, it, it's a lot. And so yeah. that just goes to show the market share that we have, the presence that we have in DFW, um, you know, from a. a, a a brokerage standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so some of those target pocket areas, you know, we can reference. <clears throat> You've got the South Lake area. Uh, Frisco, Frisco area is hot. Fort Worth proper, you know, it's a different vibe out here in Fort Worth. So you can get a more of a historic home. Um, people are drawn to from the Austin area. We get a lot of people carrying over from from California. I mean, it's funny, too, because some of the Northern California and the Southern California, it's a different vibe, you know, mm. from, the, from the Californians, you know, some want a little bit more city metro life and then some kind of want a little bit more, uh, you know, more of a low key central sure. Austin type eclectic vibe. Walkability is important. Um, and then, of course, the gated neighborhoods. I mean, there's several gated neighborhoods and people want that extra layer of protection, security. Um, so we're starting to see a lot of these little smaller um, you know, developers are carving out these, you know, 40 home mm -hmm. to 80 home pocket developments that are gated, <clears throat> larger one acre home sites, mm -hmm. you know, you can fit on these one acre home sites. I mean, they're, they're putting, you know, anywhere from 45 to 6,500 square foot homes, big houses, uh, li livable square foot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think COVID really start, you know, um, letting people realize the value in the larger homes mm -hmm. uh, with having space, um, dedicated <laughs> space. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny. I say that we laugh about it. But at mm -hmm. one point we were kind of thinking that the larger homes were going to go away yep. because developers won't want to go more dense. So they were building these little 40 foot wide home yep. sites. Right. Yep. And they were going vertical with the two level. And then the three story townhomes were taken off out here. Yep. And uh, it's interesting, but then they put more green space, more trails and parks mm -hmm. and schools and all these other amenities, but smaller home sites. Mm -hmm. and, and we're like, man, I think this is kind of a trend. People were downsizing and then COVID hit. It's like, oh, shit, people want to upsize. Yep. You know, we need that, that home office, that fifth bedroom, that, yep. you know, that second on, uh, primary downstairs with the attached ensuite for a living nanny or mother-in-law suite. You know, those are some huge value adds. And yeah. so homes now that are 4,000 plus square foot that have that second primary downstairs with the connected ensuite that has the um, the fifth bedroom or at least the fourth bedroom with a dedicated study and a potential game room and media room. Yeah. Like all those are real value added and people are fighting over those in certain markets for sure, trying to get their hands on that. Yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting right now. So for sure. So I imagine because of the low inventory environment as well, that the um, it's it's a seller's market where you are. I mean, if you're looking to put your house on a market, you're you're probably going to sell in days, assuming that you're priced correctly. If you're priced correctly and it shows well, um, I think those are obviously huge factors. And then, of course, location, um, you know, so being in a great location, one of these high demand areas. Um, and then of course, you know, being realistic with pricing, I think we're still seeing some sellers mm -hmm. that are wanting to still get a little bit more 2021, you know, 2021 aggressive. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, but you got to realize that some of these buyers are not just buying cash. Uh, some are still leveraging some debt, you know, they're leveraging bank financing and, yep. you know, it's interesting, man, that, that at $1.4 million house at, at three and a half, four percent interest, it hits a little bit differently when you're at six and a half. Right. That's correct. Um, now that's like a $1.6 million house, that's <laughs> 1.75. Yeah. So, um, and we try to educate our sellers about that, you know, um, honestly, man, like, um, I get a lot of fret from my colleagues cause I'm a buyer's agent at heart. Okay. So, you yeah. know, they say li list to last, right. Sure. I get it. I believe it. Right. Um, buyer's agents, man, and especially what we're going through right now with the NAR and all mm -hmm. this talk. Um, but I've got a really high, um, you know, um, conversion rate, acceptance rate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have a client right now I'm working with um, agents only, the sellers are only paying a specific commission and we've got a representation agreement at a, a, another commission mm -hmm. and, and there's a there's a gap there, right? Sure. And so 
uh, my sellers like my buyers like man listen don't worry about that it's done we know your value there's no mm -hmm. questions asked you know you know that that's getting taken care of you yeah. know you're, you're worth every every dime and so um, I think that's one thing, man, for me is as, as I am a buyer's agent at heart, for sure. Um, I do enjoy listings and marketing real estate. But man, for me, it's nothing like, you know, having a client walk to that front door and, and like, Julian, this is it, man. Mm -hmm. What do we got to do to get this done? And then working with the lender to kind of, you know, strategize on offer presentation. If they're leveraging debt, um, working with their wealth managers and advisement team on how to, you know, um, how we can better position and leverage an opportunity to, to, to get a deal. Right. Because mm -hmm. um, there's still some deals happening right now, for sure. Uh, I got a client right now. Um, I mean, literally, we're in one of the hottest markets and we're seeing that some of these properties where they came out the gate high in the Q1 are starting to sit, you know, yep. um, as yep. we're getting into we're, the summer months and those sellers were kind of holding firm. Right. And then we saw a dip in price mm -hmm. reduction. And now that we're catching, we're kind of on that dip. And like now is the time to really capitalize on it because now more buyers are entering the market. Now it's summertime. And so. We're trying to catch those that have caught that dip. They're at that dip where we can capitalize here before yep. now that extra buyer pool comes out. And um, and now those are all getting scooped up. And so um, so we're in some we got a few deals in escrow now that our buyers are, are I would say, winning for sure. Um, and, and I'm excited for them because, you know, they were they were patient. They were aggressive, like that passive aggressive approach. Mm -hmm. And things were kind of timing out because they were in their rentals, kind of phasing out of the rentals. And so, um, you know, you got to make that decision. You don't want to extend that lease. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get into this market um, and this negotiation and, and take advantage of it before it gets real crazy as we get in the latter part of the summer. Julian, where where does your luxury market start in DFW? So for, in DFW, it's interesting because I would say that our luxury market is really over that three and a half, you know, okay. four, four million. That's, okay. that's kind of where it's considered. That's considered luxury. Okay. Um, you know, I don't think you'll have any pushback on that. Um, but again, I think that, you know, even in that one point, that 1.5, 1.3, I mean, you're getting a luxury home. You Is know, that the funny. sweet spot? Is that where you're seeing a lot of consumers going towards? There really is. Yeah. Okay. And so like, and even my athletes, for example, I've got, a uh, uh, one of my football guys, he's, uh, he plays right now and he's an active player. And they wanted it was a referral actually from one of our S and E agents yeah. out in and um in uh, Houston. So shout out Alicia Jammer. Alicia Jammer's the best. She's the yeah. best. Oh man, yeah. She's the best. So we had a client. Uh, she referred a client over. Um, their wealth manager um, was very active in the process as well. We picked them up, picked him up. The wealth manager, everybody's riding out. Right, mm -hmm. we're all looking at properties, and so. Uh, well, we landed on a property that was in, in Frisco, like right up, like close to the tollway, um, really hot area. And so uh, in a gated, gated subdivision, one of those little pocket 80 to 100 home subdivisions, mm -hmm. gated at the front, uh, one way in, one way out, um, right off the tollway and very close to his off-season training facility, which was really important for him to be close to his off-season training facility. Um, and this property we landed on, honestly, it was a new construction a uh, custom builder, smaller mm -hmm. builder, builder mm -hmm. only builds probably about eight to 12 houses a year. Yeah. And um, this property was about, it had just got their certificate of occupancy. So they just finished it, mm -hmm. just got their CEO. And we came in and we, we got that property for less than, I think one point, I think we landed at 1.3, 1.3. Okay. Yeah. 1.3. And we're talking yeah. 4,600, 4,600 square foot, you know, That's a big like house. we mentioned, uh, Three rooms, a gym, private little gym area, ensuite downstairs, primary downstairs. So I had three rooms down, open concept, yeah. really small yard though, mm -hmm. which was fine. Really small backyard because they didn't want a lot of maintenance. They mm -hmm. wanted a lock and lock and leave opportunity with not a lot of yard maintenance. Um, and um, it's it was it was a phenomenal opportunity. So um, and then the house next door literally start breaking ground. Um, they're in. Uh, you know, rough end phase right now. Mm -hmm. So they're roughing in the plumbing, et cetera. And it's actually listed by another compass colleague of ours mm -hmm. and pretty much the same specs and the renderings came out. The renderings look pretty damn comparable to our house. Mm -hmm. 
and they're listing that property for half a million dollars more than what we just got. Oh, ours yeah. For. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so when you Good talk about him. potential upside, that's man, right. You know, because that was the play, right? They were like, well, maybe this is a two to three year investment. If we got to get out of here, we get traded or we just want to do something different, then can I get out of this property? Mm. So um, I just um, I was interviewed by Dallas Morning News and I have a publication that's out there that was launched on the Internet. It was about the biggest misconceptions on um, athletes and their purchases. Right. Everyone thinks that that our athletes are buying these three, four, five million, mm -hmm. twenty million dollar houses. Yeah. They're not. It's yeah. actually the complete opposite. Correct. And so, um, like for instance, that property was you know one point three. Um, got one of our cowboy players. Uh, he actually came out of a lease, and we put him in to buy and work with his wealth manager as well. Um, and we found him in Frisco as well, um, a new construction townhome, right? Three level townhome, front entry garage. Uh, two levels of uh, living space. Um, and we landed on that property for under $700,000. Oh, beautiful. And when you talk about located within five miles from the new Universal Studios that just got released and announced that they're building a Universal Studios here in Frisco, Texas. Really? A, a smaller version, more of a smaller kit type of vibe, but it's going to be like a boutique Universal Studios was mm -hmm. approved through economic development, and they're going to be breaking ground about five miles away from this from this player's. Uh, and he was asking me, and his team was asking me, "Can we get out if he gets traded? Uh, can we get out? Put a tenant in? No problem." So we we ran market rent. The HOA allows for rentals now, not short term though. We couldn't get the short term, but um, the still twelve month rents. A lot of executives, a lot of, there's a couple of hospitals right there close by. There's a university um, of North Texas that just opened up a campus mm. another three miles away. So you got students, you know, that need 12 month housing leases. And so, uh, again, man, this is just more of a macro perspective sure. on how we assess these opportunities for our clients. And every client's different. And our baseball guys, they like to buy. They like, mm. you know, it's different type of contracts, mm. long term contracts. Um, and so, um, those are the ones that are going like to the South Lake, Colleyville, West Lake, um, in some of these larger estate homes that you can get in for that two, two and a half, you know, three million, three and a half million, you know, they'll spend, they'll spend a little bit, especially when they're neither newly retired, um, you know, or they're kind of on the back end of their contract, uh, or their back end of their career, you know, phasing out a long-term contract that they're playing through. Um, and so um, it just makes sense that, that, you know, for them to kind of have a place, a homestead. Right. Um, and there's a lot of advantages of buying and having a homestead property here in Dallas, Fort Worth, um, i.e. no state tax. Yep. Um, secondly, we have the homestead exemption that you can file and get a 15 percent tax break. Um, I think it's actually increased um, <clears throat> off your um, school tax. Um, so that saves quite several thousands, depending on what price point of purchase you're in. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of different advantages of owning your primary residence here in, in Texas, specifically Dallas Fort Worth. So, yeah, yeah, man. I mean, so much that you you went through there and uh, I, I'm I'm really curious uh, as to uh, what sort of strategy, Julian, are you recommending to your pro athlete, um, your pro athlete clients when it comes to investing in real estate? Is it more so? Uh, related to, hey, let's let's find a great primary piece of property for you in a great location. You know, keep it simple from that approach. Or are there some other uh, different um, paths that you're taking in addition to that? For sure, I think that's usually the first starting point, right? <clears throat> um, is your primary residence, yeah. right? Um, I think that depending on what stage of their career they're in, I think that obviously matters. It's very important, uh, but also their risk tolerance. I think once you start, um, you know, talking about investing, right? It's you know you want to make sure that you know some guys want to be a little bit overly aggressive, mm -hmm. you know, as they're younger, um, so they want to take more of an aggressive approach, um, and then somewhat kind of that long term, you know stability of like, let me just start with my primary. Let me get through my career. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to get in over my head, um, you know, especially some of our football guys. But um, I think that's definitely the first. But then also they've got a team around them as well. So you kind of 
you can you can give your you know opinions and, and professional advice, but they've got a financial advising team. Most of the guys, wealth managers, financial advisors, and they know where that limit is and that tolerance, sure. where that where that barometer is. You know, do 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 do. Now we want we don't want to go beyond that. And so at that point, and that's what the majority of it is. Uh, I do have some younger guys that have recently retired. Um, there's one particularly. Um, shout out to my guy uh, Taylor Gabriel, TG. Um, and he came out of his career uh, with the Chicago Bears and had a great career and, um, you know, acquired his first primary residence. Uh, we actually were neighbors mm -hmm. and um, I actually didn't help him. I didn't know him at the time. I just knew him because I was the listing agent on the home that he bought. OK. And so <laughs> and it was funny because like my backyard and his front door, like and we got a, this pool in the backyard water. And mm -hmm. I have my music playing. I'm out there <laughs> cleaning the pool. You vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm seeing my, my, my signs in the yard on the house in front, right? It's my listing in my neighborhood. And he was pulling up and all in all these in a different car every time his agent was shown on the property. Mm -hmm. And um come to find out, long story short, his his realtor was his uh, one of his childhood friends. Okay. And so he um, you know, I, you know, I went the battle for my seller on the on the negotiations. I, I felt we gotta, you know, it's one of those you, you fight and then you hug it out at the end to sure. get it done. Yep. You don't never want to lose a deal in a negotiation. It's right. got to feel good for both parties. That's you know, right. You know, in most instances. Uh, well, anyway, he, he got into the home. We developed a relationship and he tells me, he's like, man, listen, um, I was the one who really kind of helping the negotiations on myself, feel for myself. And I was like, really? And he said, uh, but, you know, you, you, you kind of got the best of us, man. I'm going to be honest <laughs> with you. He says, uh, but I want to ask you, man, like, I want to get into real estate. And I want to see if that's something that you would, you know, kind of share with me a little bit about how to do that. And so we started out with some investing, smaller stuff. Um, you know, it was one of those, you know, he was kind of representing himself from a management, wealth management mm -hmm. side. And so he was just like, what would you do with X, Y, Z amount of money? And I was like, well, you know, first of all, I wouldn't even start with that much right there. I would say, let's maybe scale it back a little bit kind of get into some opportunities and you start going the um, the route of partnering with some smaller builders that were building small spec homes. Yeah. Uh, we're talking in reviving areas. So areas that, you know, are turning, get a little bit more tension, mm -hmm. you know, um, where you can build a home for, you know, a few hundred thousand and you could sell it with a really nice return. And so there were some smaller builders that were lo looking into bring in some debt. Um, and uh, with really large returns on those, you know, really good ROI. And, um, and so um, he knew some a mutual guy as well. And so he jumped into one of those and he started seeing how that investment turned out and it worked out really well. Mm -hmm. And then now um, he's been able to forge some really high level relationships with some of the largest developers in our area mm -hmm. that he was able to get in the door with. And now they're doing some really large scale uh, development projects. I would say in a matter of the last three years, he's now probably got a pipeline of about, you know, 50 to a hundred million dollars going. Outstanding. Um, yeah. So it's a really good testimony, man. And, um, you know, and so, um, to see what he's doing and he's actually bringing some of his friends in, you know, as well. And just to see that growth, man, and just to, how he just was head down focus and hard work in very sharp, very sharp and, um, and strategic as well. And, um, you know, so we help facilitate and put them around a team, um, you know, from uh, making recommendations on CPAs and attorneys, real estate attorneys, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, just being a value add there and just, you know, and, and he's a friend. So, yeah. Um, and it's neat, man, to see that. So, yeah, I think that's one example. The other example, primary residences, um, that home that we're talking about, I, he wanted something more gated now. And so I end up selling that home as his listing agent. Um in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. he, he did very, very well on the exit. And then we ended up landing on a property in a gated community that a builder was trying to offload. And we mm. walked into some really good equity. Yep. And um, and now he's even contemplating selling that property um, and making a very, very large return. So he's, he's done very well. Um, and so those are kind of one of those real one-on-one -on -one concierge type of um, relationships that we've established um, for sure. And so um, but yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. It's been fun. i um, doing it. And, um, again, we just take on what we can, what we take on. I'm not, we don't really get out there. I think that's why we're not really, you know, high volume driven anymore personally sure. myself. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a different chapter of my career that's over right. the last a couple of years. 
Um, and so I've slowed down a lot. I've been, I'm enjoying my weekends. There you go. I'm enjoying my weekends. Good. Uh, we, we move and shake Monday through Thursday. Sometimes yep. we gotta, we gotta jump out there on the weekend, depending on clients schedule and their demand for that. Yeah. But, um, for the most part, man, we're very small private client type of interactions and relationships that we've been able to develop and, and we're still building those out. You know, I think being a part of our, our team, sports entertainment here around mm -hmm. the country with, you know, people like yourself, Steve, and, you know, other colleagues, it's neat to have those relationships to where we know when these opportunities come up, you know, we need someone there in this marketplace that where we can pick up the phone and, and, and feel very confident referring that opportunity out, man. I just referred an executive client out to our Tampa market. Yeah. Kind of say we into that. Yeah. Uh, so shout out to uh, John Fincher, Eric Dungy and our Tampa man. Thank you guys. Man, they're um, those guys are class acts right there. Absolutely. So a good friend of mine, he's a CEO of uh, hospital out there running that division in Tampa, it was relocated his family. And uh, Eric and John did an amazing job, landed mm. them on a great opportunity. They closed it a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so just the power of that man is, is everything for sure. The power of the network. Julian, this has been so special. And I mean, just the wealth of information that you have to share. I mean, we could go for another hour, um, but but uh, you're a busy man and you got you got people to see and things to do. Um, before I let you go, any last remarks you would like to leave with the audience, my friend? Oh, man, I would say, um, first of all, to you, man, thank you again, Steve, for doing this. Um, my pleasure. You know. It's, a, it's an honor, man, to be on here and, and to be able to share. And, um, you know, I think that there's a lot that, you know, of information, there's a lot of uh, experience out there and it takes platforms like this to reach people that may have the same questions or going through the same stuff, man. So it's a it's an honor for me to be able to share this and give back. You know, it's a way of giving back for me because um, there's a lot that I've learned over the years. Um, and yeah, man, just first of all, I want to say that, you know, uh, secondly, um, you know, for those that are in this space or looking to get into this space, um, just note that, you know, things take time, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this almost 20 years. And, and like I said, I didn't really segue into kind of the sports and entertainment piece um, until the last probably, you know, four or five years. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it's just um, just stay true to who you are, um, you know, be genuine, be authentic, uh, be transparent um, and just, you know, um, you know, don't try to force things. I think that yeah. working with some of our clients, you know, having that um, that sense of trust is obviously key. And so um, you got one shot to, to 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 get that. And, you know, it could it could it could be taken away very quickly. I always tell my younger agents that ask me that work with me like, man, how do I how do I get into this? I want to do this. I want to work with this person. And how do I get in? And honestly, it's like, you know, it's you know, people can sense that when you're trying to, you know, target specific individuals, mm -hmm. I think just. You know, naturally just being a good person and, you know, um, honing in on your craft. Um, I think that people will seek out that. Right. And I think, um, you know, it's a law of attraction. Yeah. And so and also just, you know, putting yourself in uh, opportunity when you get that opportunity to execute on it, um, because um, we shared a lot. But there's a couple opportunities that I missed out early. I just wasn't ready. You know, I wasn't ready for it. Um, and so um, I think now. At this point in time, it just takes time and a lot of a lot of practice, right? A lot of uh, yep. a lot of work that you have to put in. So, um, but again, just stay in it. Um, and then we're in a weird market right now, right? We know mm -hmm. there's a lot of changes happening in our industry. Um, you know, we're constantly pivoting and evolving, but we got a very resilient um, mm -hmm. industry that we're in with a lot of good people. And I think that um, you know, I think there's a lot of great agents out there. Um, they say everyone knows at least 10 agents, right? Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> but I think uh, we're seeing a lot of exit though as well from some of the younger yeah. agents. So I would say if they're, if you're younger, uh, just stay in it, man. I think uh, don't give up on it. You know, um, you got to pivot. It's just something we've gone through three recessions now or industry changes, I call it over the last, you know, almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would just leave it at that. So again, man, uh, I've got my information I could throw on here. Um, you can reach me, you Please know, my do. IG. Yeah. Yeah, my IG is a uh, first name, last name. So Julian Williams, uh, DFW as in Dallas, Fort Worth. And then uh, we've got a site, uh, the JW Group DFW uh, com. So easy. Julian Williams, my friend, thank you so much for your time, my brother. All right. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Can't stop. We can't lose. You can't win if you snooze. So do more. Say less, so get up and let's work and be the best. Yeah, it's tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast. Yeah, the Steve Gunner Podcast. It's tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast.
podcast. Get up.